Kia ora koutou katoa. Good afternoon. Today I will set out Cabinet's decisions on alert levels in Auckland, Northland and the Waikato, as well as signal announcements for the rest of the week. Firstly, though, I want to say something briefly about Super Saturday. We all know what it meant for vaccine numbers. 130,000 people vaccinated in one day is enormous. It was a tribute to the health staff, to the people who have been working tirelessly alongside them for months, community organisations who worked so hard to support people to be there, the business community who promoted the day and provided every reason and incentive possible to be vaccinated. The biggest success of Super Saturday, alongside the lives saved, is that it reminded us all we are still a team. That through this really hard few months, if we have a job to do, we will rally to do it. Today we are making decisions that are based on the here and now, alert level decisions that are based on case numbers and what we can do safely. And this has been primarily affecting Auckland, but also now the Waikato and Northland. We know that in the future, we cannot ask people to live week by week, not knowing when things will change or how to help things speed up. We know that needs to change and we have a plan on how. While the announcements today will be about the next few weeks, on Friday, we'll provide the detail around the system we will use to protect ourselves in a highly vaccinated environment. We'll give details on how we'll move into that new system and what will help us get there. On Tuesday, I'll be joined by Minister Henare to talk about the work we're doing to lift vaccination rates in our Māori communities. This work is absolutely critical. On Wednesday, Minister Hipkins will present the up-to-date advice on schools reopening. And on Friday, as I said, we'll release the details of the new COVID protection framework and how we'll get there. But for now, let's come to the alert level decisions. Today, Cabinet has confirmed that New Zealand, outside of those areas with level three restrictions, will remain at alert level two. I'll come then to the decisions for Northland, the Waikato, and then Auckland. Let's start with Northland. With more than 16,000 tests undertaken since the first positive case, and testing across 19 wastewater sites, all returning negative results, all the evidence to date suggests the individuals who tested positive in Northland have not spread it further. I would, however, always ask anyone with symptoms to get a test and anyone still waiting to get a vaccination. On this basis, and on the advice of the Director General of Health, Northland will move to alert level two at 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday the 19th, um, uh, the 19th of October. For the Waikato, the situation is different. While the cases remain broadly linked, this linking is often occurring after the positive results are being t are returned. I acknowledge the testing more than 45,000 and vaccination efforts of those in the region beyond this, uh, during this period. But as, as you will have seen, there have been further cases and some positive wastewater testing in the greater area. And so we need to act with caution at the moment. That is why Cabinet has decided to hold the Waikato at level three. We will review these settings and update any change in position on Friday. And now to Auckland. Today is day 62 of alert level four or three in Tamaki Makoto. That is a long time to have been living with restrictions. But those restrictions have made a huge difference. They've helped us to keep case numbers as low as possible while we continue to vaccinate people. And vaccinations continue to be so important, not just in the future, but right now. Only 4% of cases in this outbreak were people who were fully vaccinated. And of the 158 who needed hospital care, only three were fully vaccinated. But we need to keep going with both tools, our restrictions and vaccinations, because with Delta, we cannot rely on just one. If we get this right, if we keep case numbers low while we vaccinate people, then it makes it easier for us to keep control of COVID while we ease restrictions in the future. And that is everyone's goal. So the question for Cabinet today has been how do we avoid a spike in case numbers and hospitalisations 
and protect vulnerable communities as much as possible in the coming weeks while we keep lifting vaccination numbers. First, it is important to remember that the Alert Level 3 rules in Auckland are currently the toughest restrictions in place anywhere in the OECD at the moment, according to the Oxford Stringency Index. These are not soft rules. Despite that, a number of respected scientists and epidemiologists have suggested a return to Level 4 for a defined two-week lockdown to act as a circuit breaker and limit the number of cases while our vaccinations take hold and strengthen our immunity. However, the public health advice, including from teams on the ground and from Dr Ashley Bloomfield, is that two more weeks at level four is unlikely at this stage to reduce the number of cases significantly because of the nature of the outbreak and the fact that compliance has been an issue. We considered both sets of advice carefully. Cabinet has to take into account a range of factors, including the overall well-being of Aucklanders and how hard this period has been. But the consideration that stood out for the, us the most was the view amongst those closest to the outbreak that this increase in restrictions would not necessarily reduce cases significantly more than the level three restrictions we already have. So the next question is what can we do at level three to minimize cases as much as possible? The first thing cabinet has decided is that Auckland will remain at alert level three and with the current restrictions already in place, and that we will do that for the next two weeks. Based on the advice we have, any interim easing of level three restrictions over the coming weeks will not work towards our plan of minimizing cases while we increase vaccinations. But the biggest thing that will make a difference right now alongside vaccines is asking that everyone continue to comply with the restrictions that are already there. In particular, the alert level rules around indoor gatherings. They are not allowed. They are a risk to you and those around you. And they are one of the most significant causes of ongoing spread in this outbreak. And no one is in an area where the rules don't apply. We now have cases in 124 suburbs. They are across the entire geographical spread of Auckland. That means everyone, especially those who are unvaccinated, continue to be at risk of getting the virus regardless of what suburb you live in. So a reminder on the rules at level three, they are there to help us for this critical phase. Please stick to your household bubble. The only social catch-ups that are allowed have to take place outdoors because the natural ventilation of fresh air reduces the risk of passing on the virus. We ask that you be masked and distanced with no more than 10 people from two households at any one time. Indoor gatherings, parties, social catch-ups, they're not part of level three. And it's one of the things we cannot afford to let slip. I know this is hard, and I want to acknowledge the ongoing impact in particular on Auckland business of staying at level three. We've heard the call from the Auckland business community for additional support given the extended period of restrictions. Minister Robertson is currently working on an enhanced business support package for Auckland, and we'll be in a position to share more of the details of this on Friday. And finally, a quick preview to the announcements on Friday. When we come to outline the new COVID protection framework, we will establish a vaccination target, or as Dr Bloomfield calls it, a milestone, for Auckland and New Zealand in order to move into that framework and to start easing restrictions. The target will be high to give us the greatest confidence possible. We've looked closely at the evidence overseas and what works and what doesn't, We'll be aligning our target with those countries that have managed the transition from restrictions to vaccination in the safest way possible. But regardless, we hope that this will give Aucklanders especially as much certainty as possible about what lies ahead and importantly, a goal that we can all rally behind. So in summary, our plan is as follows. Auckland will stay at level three with no further changes to the level three settings at this stage. This is the best way to continue to suppress and minimise cases while we work towards high rates of vaccination. These settings will remain for two weeks. On Friday, we will set out uh, the new protection framework, a plan to continue to protect New Zealanders from the virus, and it will include a vaccination target to meet before moving into that framework. I have one final message. On Super Saturday, we saw what was possible. 
The vaccine is all about opening up opportunities and easing restrictions. Just as we smashed our target of 100,000 vaccines on Saturday, we know that when we set a goal, we can reach it. We're making great steps forward, and there is a way through. New Zealand can be one of the few countries in the world to get to high rates of vaccination without the human and economic carnage it has inflicted on so many other countries. It is possible, and I know we can do it. I'm you know, happy to take questions. Prime Minister, what's the target? What's the target? I uh, will be sharing those details on Friday. You already, you already know, though, so why not lend a bit more? We are continuing to work on refining some of the details of both the framework and the way the target will work, and so that is why we'll be releasing that on Friday. From um, what you know of the vaccine numbers now and, and how they're likely to roll out over the coming couple of weeks, do you expect that Auckland will move down to level two or a loosening of restrictions in, in two weeks' time? So our view was to set out as much as we could um, the path for the next few weeks. and. Uh, based on what we've seen now and our ongoing job to continue to just keep this outbreak in check while we continue to vaccinate, the advice was to hold where we are. You know, again, we won't rule out um, future changes after that point, but what we know Auckland needs is a long-term plan, and that is what we'll be setting out on Friday. Give us the target, 95%. We'll not be giving the target today. And look, I think it was only fair to tell Auckland that there will be one so that we know the way that we will be working with the new framework. But I don't want to waste everyone in this room's time by, um, by, by fishing for it at this point. 95% of work to do. Yes, Dr. Bloomfield, do you think if you set a target of 95% today, it might actually incentivise people to push up? Uh, I think we've seen uh, the situation in Auckland, including the outbreak, as well as um, support and campaigns from, from the media and others to get those vaccination rates up as high as possible have really paid dividends. And, you know, we can see Auckland's getting close to what is a very important milestone of 90 per cent. And the reason I call it a milestone is we are not stopping there. Every percentage point above 90 really matters. So we're just going to keep the effort going. Keep in mind as well, for the most part, we see those who get one vaccine go and get their second. But actually, uh, there tends to be about a 5 per cent difference between the two. Um, so that is why we need to keep going. It's not enough just to say, you know, you've hit one milestone and you stop. We do need to keep going. I'll come to you, um, yep. Councillor James. Jason. I mean, how close was it? Was the call around the circuit breaker? And can you give us a little more information? Yeah, sure. On, on why public health officials don't think a, a circuit breaker would have a significant impact on. So I'll let, I'll let Dr. Bloomfield speak to that himself. But I, we have always listened to all of the advice that's been available to us, both from our scientific community, epidemiologists, and our public health uh, experts. Uh, and uh, the strong advice that came through to us from public health on the ground was that knowing what they know about the outbreak as it stands, their view was that level four would not necessarily make a significant difference to the cases that we have in this current outbreak. And that's because of what they know in a detailed way about where the outbreak has occurred uh, and whether or not uh, an increase on restrictions would necessarily have stopped the kind of activity that has led to a flow on of cases. However, level three, if followed, actually would make a difference and will continue to make a difference. And that's why that strong message to Auckland is you've done an amazing job. I know it's been hard, but please stick with it while we vaccinate. We need ongoing compliance. Uh, that compliance is an issue. What makes you think that Aucklanders are going to be any more um, responsive to following the rules at the moment when we're seeing pretty, you know, some pretty widespread incidents? And, yeah. and how critical is that if they're going to stay in for another two weeks? So I think the important point um, for us to know is actually we're, we're seeing that, as I've said, that that household, uh, uh, that household's mixing with others uh, indoors and or on a, at a larger scale um, is one of the contributing factors to the outbreak. We also know that we do, we have had an outbreak in, in parts of the community where um, life is particularly tough. So we've talked before about transitional housing and so on. And so for us, it's about continuing to highlight where we know restrictions will make a difference. Please stick with them. Uh, we don't just make them up. They are based on evidence and the advice of public health. And where we do say it is possible to mingle with others outside, that's because the advice is that that is safe. So it is all based on strong guidance. I don't know if it's anecdotal, but and I don't know whether this is what you were referring to in your opening remarks about 
it doesn't matter where you live in Auckland, yes. you, you know, you are vulnerable. I mean, we're, we're hearing that <coughs> in some of the wealthier suburbs, there's quite a high level of non-compliance. As I said, this is not scientific, it's anecdotal. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? So that, what I was talking there is, about there is that I've picked up a sense that some people think that this is an outbreak in just certain parts of Auckland, and that is not true. It is absolutely not true. We have cases across the entire geographical areas of Auckland. Um, basically, any suburb you can name, we probably have a person or a household that's been affected. And so no one should say or think that they can act differently just because they're in a particular part of Auckland that will not be the case. A bit of a rich port of you know, has that, be has that become a bit I've of a feature of it? Or is that just that? And that would be wrong. So that's why I found it necessary just to highlight that that is, that is not correct. It's an assumption that is, that is absolutely wrong. Sorry, I did say that I was going to come over to Jason. In that vein, have you seen the footage of the party that happened on the North Shore over the weekend? I have, I have not seen the footage. I have had it described to me. The description was enough. What, did, what would you say to those uh, people involved in that party? That clearly it was a blatant breach of the rules, clearly. Uh, and I think you've seen the reaction of Aucklanders to what's happened there. They have a different approach to compliance through the police. I mean, I know that often for these sorts of things, they are guided by health when we were talking about it last year. Um, but, you know, is there a point at which the police will take a tougher stance on, I suppose, these more domestic um, situations or blatant breaches, especially when it's like out on social media? You know, it's obviously infuriating a lot of people as well. But. Yeah, and right, and, and you can absolutely understand why. Um, police have, though, as I understand, confirmed that an investigation is underway in response to that particular uh, event and, and into the reported breach of COVID-19 restrictions there. So uh, that's where, you know, we'll let the police do their job. But obviously they were called to that address, they followed through on that, and now they're investigating what happened there. So no one should assume that, you know, you can just break the rules and that there won't be consequence for that. Um, the police approach and the enforcement approach part of this, you know, as part of this compliance issue and as we go forward when people are more resistant, the knowledge that if you're going to do it blatantly, you are, you know, you're going to face consequences. Like one of the things that, uh, you know, because we've looked at, looked around the world where you've had periods of, long periods of time where people have been in restriction. And I think we talked about this last week. You know, looking at, at Australia, who had the same restrictions for a very long period, and then you just see it at a tipping point after a period of time where, where cases just balloon. And one of the things that is, we thought a lot about before making the decision around people being able to meet outside was if you are going to break the rules, you're probably by and large going to try and do that in a hidden way so as not to draw attention to yourself. And that is likely to be inside, which is the most dangerous place for people to break rules. So that's why we were very deliberate in saying here is a safe way that you can have social contact to help you continue with what are pretty tough restrictions. But that means we're asking you, do not congregate inside with others. That is, we've given you a safe way where you can be seen to be complying and where people can see that you're just doing the right thing outside. Please don't go inside and continue that kind of congregation. That is the risk and we've seen it in this outbreak. Prime Prime Minister, 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 just, on, just on the back to the traffic light system, I mean, it seems like this is quite a strong incentive, or whatever the system might be. Um, this seems like it would be quite a, an effective way of getting the vaccine rates up. Why isn't this something that the government did um, a number of weeks ago in, in a bid to try and boost those vac vaccination numbers quicker? We've been working on the framework for a number of weeks. Uh, it is something that you will have seen based on, I think, everyone's reporting, that it is something that we have been consulting people on. And we've had the ability to do that while we're vaccinating because it uses vaccine certificates. And so in order for those to be used, of course, you have to have reasonable levels of vaccination and we also have to have the vaccination certificate regime in place. But I think the framework itself will also be an incentive because it uses vaccine certificates as well. And so people will be able to see that and have time to adapt and get ready for it reporting about it being a traffic light system. Can you confirm that's what's on its way? Oh, so look, yeah, you've obviously covered and we've talked publicly with, well, we've talked in consultation with people around the system. Um, and so, yes, that's the way people have described it. I think you'll hear me using a COVID protection framework because it is still about protecting people from COVID and that's what it's designed to do. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'll just come into the front and Derek.
Do you have a projection on, uh, based on bookings, where Auckland's eligible population vaccination will be in two weeks' time? Uh, in two weeks' time? Well, we, we just have, we have the current book, we have the current, what the bookings in its totality will take us to. I don't know if it's broken down by Auckland, though. Uh, the, ex the expectation is uh, we, our team is modelling out that Auckland uh, increases on a daily basis and then uh, carrying those forward. So um, sooner or later this week, we're hoping sooner, Auckland will hit that 90% milestone for first vaccinations. And then you would imagine between three and four weeks after that, um, overall 40%. That's for the whole Auckland metro region. Do you have a prediction for what the double dose will be in two weeks' time? No, but we could, uh, we could have a look at that. I, I imagine, I think at the moment they're over 70%, so I, I'd imagine it'd be yeah, well over 80%. Double, dose. Yeah, double dose at the moment, 71. Do you want it on just bookings or projections? On, on projection, and yeah. you know, also the, obviously some people are walking in. Yeah, because bookings aren't a great forecasting mechanism for us anymore. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of the, over the last few weeks, most of the vaccinations have been each day, in Auckland and elsewhere, have been walk-ins. There's a lot of capacity there in the system. But in, a, in two weeks' time, I would fully expect it would be well, and it would be between 80 and 85 per cent of Auckland of Aucklanders overall would be um, double dosed. Based on that, Prime Minister, if the current cases trajectory doesn't continue, you know, continues as it is, do you think in two weeks' time Auckland would be you to get to the Yeah, so what, two? what we've said is that we will continue uh, to, at that point, look at, as we said, those stepping down, uh, uh, that stepping down framework, we'll continue to use that in the meantime. So we will keep making a judgment about whether or not we can safely continue to step down. Oh, oh, I'm Joe. Um, just on Maori vaccination rate, um, yeah. are you happy, I guess, with uh, the way that sort of collaboration and communication has gone on there with Maori health providers? Um, I take the example of Tairawhiti, mm -hmm. who crowd funded $100,000 at the weekend for what seems to have been something that the Minister Penny Hinata has said he spoke to them last week and they never mentioned that it was something they needed and that it would have been funded through that money. Absolutely. And then the example of, say, the Taranaki DHB and Hayden Wano, who's uh, one of the Māori health provider chief execs there, who says it's just really difficult to actually share information and resource with the DHB, and that has uh, been part of the problem in terms of both a low general rate and a low Māori rate in Taranaki. Are you concerned at how bad some of this collaboration and communication has any effect that that's actually having on the Māori vaccination rate? Yeah, yeah. so I'll make a general comment and then I just want to say something very briefly about Tairawhiti if I can. So, so over the last, or oh, it would be two to three weeks now, after hearing some of the feedback that there may be barriers for our Māori providers, we wanted to cut through those as quickly as we could. We brought together uh, DHBs um, and Māori and Pacific providers across the different DHBs where we knew that they were working really hard to try and lift those rates. Um, minister, uh, ministers were a part of those calls, and so was I. Uh, as a consequence of that, we made some commitments to try and change the way we were working on some elements of funding, data sharing, a range of things that we thought would help support vaccination rollout. Subsequent to that, we've had Minister Hinare out on the road. And that's one of the reasons I'd like to bring him here tomorrow is to talk about some of what he's hearing and what work we're doing to overcome that. We need to remove any barrier that might exist to enable our providers, whether or not they're health providers or whether they can help us drive demand so that we can drive up vaccination rates for our Māori communities. And everyone's committed to, do, to that. It's all just about how we get there. On Tairawhiti, I saw the report. I, someone sent me the Give a Little page. And uh, that is, no one, n not one region in this country should have to rely on a fundraising campaign to set up something that we are directly working hard to fund and support. We put additional money in to support Māori vaccination rates. I know in Tairawhiti they have mobile uh, facilities because I've been on them. They have a bus in Tairawhiti in Gisborne. They have a mobile vaccination clinic that they were using in Ruatoria when I was there. For me, this just is a question of getting the resource in the right place. So uh, we've got, we've got uh, ministers working on that as we speak because no one, there is no need to fundraise to get this vaccination campaign going. We just need to make sure that the resource is in the right place. But when you look at that, how much, because I think it's about 80 million now, isn't it, across the two tranches that has, has been put aside. What is that, 87? 
do you know roughly how much of that has been, like, what availability is there still? I'll get Mr Henry. Hey, perhaps to speak to some of that tomorrow, if I may, because my intent there was to get him to talk in a little more detail about what he's observing and what more we can do. Not there's not the money there, it's just a communication. Well, some, in some areas, the relationship with the DHBs and the movement of that funding between DHBs and providers is great. In other areas, it has been a little more difficult. And sorry, I'm just going to this around a little bit. Is this specifically on that question? Okay, when you look at that map around Tarapati, it's, it's very clear that there's gaps there where there aren't across the rest of the country. Why is the ministry not coordinating better? If, if you can't rely on the DHBs to get it done, why is the government and the ministry not coordinating better so that people don't have to go out and go to the hospital? Yeah, well... Our uh, absolute commitment is that where there are gaps or people have a difficulty accessing, that needs to change. And as I say, I've been in regions where they have uh, had mobile vaccination clinics up and down the country. Uh, it so happens that on that particular day, they weren't. I would have expected that they would be. So obviously there is work there to do. On Māori engagement, um, the traffic light system, they were a large number of Māori groups consulted on that over Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and yep. they've released a statement saying they strongly reject the traffic light framework. So how much is that going to play into what's announced on Friday? So I guess I'd say two things. Um, firstly, uh, yes, we are absolutely out there consulting, talking to various different groups, um, uh, leadership in Māori, Pacific communities, church communities, the business sector. And what I'd say is that whilst, of course, we're sharing that framework, uh, we're not always at a point where we've concluded the way it will be implemented and how we will do it safely. So my view is that once we talk more about some of that, that may satisfy some of the concerns that exist. There may potentially be a view out there that we are fundamentally going to change our approach, which is to work very hard to keep people safe from COVID. We are not. All of this, though, is about saying, we said when we had a highly vaccinated population, we would do things differently, but safely, and we will. How different is, is the version that the Māori group and the independent experts who reviewed it last Thursday going to be from what's now? So, as I, well, of course, we'll leave that to the date that it's released. But I think one of the things that people are looking for is, when will we start using it? And my message is when we have a highly vaccinated population. And I think that will make a big difference for people to hear that. Can you go into whether there's going to be like differences in access for vaccinated versus unvaccinated people? In that uh, of course, we'll wait until we release some of that framework. But you've already heard us say we will use vaccine certificates. So so on those um, meetings? And then I'll come to you, Ben. Actually, Dr Bloomfield, just to follow up on Derek's question, do you, have you got any modelling on when Auckland will hit 90% double dose, if it will? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, it, will be, it will be when 90% of people have had their second dose. But um, I'm casting for about when that might be. Well, we, we would imagine it will be three to four between three and four weeks after. At the moment, our average interval between um, first and second dose is about 28 days, so right on on four weeks. It's probably coming down since we we told people any time after three weeks, and we're expecting that first dose to reach that. 90% milestone. I would say that is right across all of Auckland, and if we do look by district health board as well, and there are differences between the district health boards. Auckland is ahead of Waitemata, which is ahead of Counties Manukau, so we're, it, it will vary a little bit by DHB. Okay, Ben. Okay, and can, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Just, could, you, could you well, uh, just, um, Could you please d describe, um, the Prime Minister said before that the, the, the advice you gave today was that uh, Liverpool lockdown probably wouldn't achieve what some of the kind of proponents of it um, say it well on the box. Uh, can you just describe to us what the tenor of your advice was around that? Well, the first point I would make that is that every time we do a public health risk assessment it, for any alert level, we, we go in with an open mind. And certainly with regards to Auckland's situation, we went in uh, considering what uh, the full range of options that could be employed. Uh, and secondly, we, uh, we looked then at a whole range of factors and I would say that our colleagues who are on the ground doing the public health response in Auckland and likewise for both Northland and Waikato are involved in those public health risk assessments. So we absolutely canvass their view about what they are seeing and whether or not they think the current restrictions or tightening or loosening those restrictions will support what they are trying to do. And in this case, 
we very clearly converged on maintaining the current level of restrictions and really emphasising two things. First of all, people complying and, and, and continuing, as, as most Aucklanders are, to um, abide by those Alert Level 3 uh, restrictions, and secondly, really continuing the vaccination program apace with a big focus on Māori and Pacifica. That was their, that, that was their focus. Yeah. Both, you both talked about the non-compliance, uh, non mm. and that there's evidence of non-compliance within homes, people going to each other's places. Mm. Uh, in what form, how has that information been coming to you? Has that been through yeah. the public health teams at the front? Yeah. I mean, public health total, team. what Yeah, the public health team. So when they uh, analyse exposure events, uh, and look through at, um, you know, and as they're contact tracing, they're getting exposure events and locations of interest and possible contacts and are identifying that there are household, that there are households getting together um, indoor, so outside of the restrictions which are contributing. And so when they did a breakdown of um, the biggest contributing factor to new cases, that was amongst the most significant. And this site was actually further, further down, yeah. Again, I would reinforce though um, that this is not everyone. Um, and you know, the, you know, a large portion of Auckland of Aucklanders have consistently been doing the right thing. We're just asking that people stick with it because we are reaching a point where it just gets harder because it's so long. Yeah. I, I did say Ben. Um, just um, back on the Maori consultations. Did you acknowledge that there was a, a groundswell of support, at least a, a large amount of support, for a return to level four? And, and in that, a, a growing sort of disconnection between what the government is doing, what many Maori want. Well, actually, I've, I've had a direct readout from that meeting because, of course, um, we had uh, uh, Māori ministers present there. Uh, and the feedback that I've received is, yes, there were some who were of the view that a move to level four was necessary, but there were some uh, who, uh, speaking from, from within Tamaki Makoto, had a different view. So I think it's fair to say that there were a range of views um, uh, in, some of the, in some of the dialogue that's been going on. Well, and you can see we've, we've, we've tried to take all of it into account, all of those competing different views. I'd apologize just switch topics and, and acknowledge the, the climate aid announcement this morning. Yes. I just thought I'd ask when um, you will decide and announce the national determined contribution ahead of COP26, and can I invite you to preempt what that might be? Uh, uh, we will make that decision in the lead up to COP26. I'll say, can we, can so I know I'm not in a position to give you a date at this at this stage. Expect New Zealand to up its targets, up its ambitions. We've all, we've always we've already said, um, and you will have seen from the Climate Commission, our view was that we needed to ensure that our uh, nationally determined contribution was in keeping with a 1.5 degree target because that's what we've got embedded in our Zero Carbon Act. So we asked the Climate Commission to give us advice. They gave us a steer that it needed to increase, and now we're doing the work to see what that looks like. So that, that should be imminently, right? That yeah, it should, it's not too far away. So, so just a couple of quickly, please. Um, does the government... You know, I'll come to you, and then I'm going to come to... Yes. I'll let you get those out of the way, and then I'm going to come to Bernard, and then we're going to come to you in the front. Does the government intend to introduce another vaccine as well as Pfizer to help boost the country's vaccination rates, given there are a portion who don't want Pfizer? And do you at least plan to recognise Kiwis as vaccinated who have had other vaccines like Janssen or Astra? Uh, yes. So... To answer that second question, uh, yes, we will have New Zealanders who will have been abroad um, who will have been vaccinated by uh, vaccines that we ourselves at some point have either been involved in purchasing or have considered purchasing. And so we are working to ensure that we can recognise those Kiwis vaccination status in New Zealand. Um, on the issue of um, other uh, vaccines, I might get Dr Bloomfield to speak to that. Yes, so we are still uh, actively working up advice uh, on an alternative for people who may um, be willing to be vaccinated but have a particular concern about the mRNA vaccines and we're nearly we've nearly finalized that advice and once it's gone to the minister and decisions have been made then I'm sure there will be an announcement about that yeah, uh, yeah. Prime Minister, Minister uh, will the vaccination um, threshold or milestone you talk about on Friday will it ensure that we wait for Maori um, young Maori uh, vaccination rates to get up to the safe level? of 90% plus. I've indicated that we'll have um, a, a milestone, as it were, an entry point, but I'm not going to speak any further to that until all of those details are finalised and presented on Friday. Not even to say it's an, an overall average or by... Because, of course, you will understand that we'll want to make announcements on that at one time on Friday. I thought it was only fair, though, that we acknowledge, given uh, issues that are being raised by some of the experts that we're consulting with, um, that we have, and we are actually, have been talking about these issues 
uh, with different groups. I only thought it right to indicate that that was part of our decision making and planning, um, but we'll be releasing details on Friday. Just on the advice that you got um, from the group of uh, epidemiologists versus the um, Ministry of Health, what were the um, what was the modelling from each group on uh, how many extra cases would come at level four versus level three? Uh, so it's very hard to model compliance, is what I've been told. What we have instead been looking at is what the R value, the reproductive value, is looking like currently. Uh, and uh, of course, what we've said, and I said this last week, uh, an R value that is closer to one means it's more likely that we'll have a lower number of cases even in the future when we're more highly vaccinated and are looking to ease restrictions. It will make it easier for us to maintain low levels of cases. So that's the goal. The R value has trended, I think previously we were looking between 1.3 and 1.4. It's looking like it's come down a bit more recently. I'll let Dr Bloomfield speak to that because I received modelling that has two different R values at the moment, so it can be um, it can be a little difficult to find the pathway through. Um, they tend to they're tending between 1.2 and 1.3 at the moment, but some R values are a little lower than that at the moment. So, so which which, what, which R value for which level? For which R value? As I've mm. said, um, the modelling uh, compliance and then the likely R value out of four versus three is quite difficult. Advice on where level four would have lowered that R value? Dr. Bluefield, do you want to speak That's to correct. that? That's correct. When uh, we talk about getting advice from epidemiologists and the experts, most of that advice comes through the media. Uh, and uh, so the views are well known. The modelling uh, can model what the trajectory might be uh, in the, with the current number of cases and depending on different R values. But what the modelling can't show is what the impact of the current settings or mm. alert level four might be on that R value. And so that's much more a judgment, and that's where, again, indeed, we canvass the views of a range of, of people, including our colleagues on the ground. Just to add to what Dr Bloomfield has said, though, we uh, uh, did have a session where we've canvassed some of the um, future framework with public health um, experts and epidemiologists as part of that. We did talk about the current outbreak in Auckland, and they did offer up views as part of that as well. So that was um, last week. Surely not having 280,000 people go to work, which is the difference between level three and level four, is going to reduce. However, keeping in mind, as I've just said, some of the work that has come out of the team on the ground in Auckland has suggested that work sites have not been one of the bigger contributing factors to cases that we've seen in recent days. Um, uh, in fact, uh, as I've said, one of the bigger contributors continues to be households. That's not to say we haven't seen cases in workplaces. We have but it hasn't been one of the bigger contributing factors. Okay, I am going to, as I said, I would. I will come to Derek in the front. Yeah. So, I just up on that from Bernard, Dr. Bloomfield. Can you tell us what the current VAX 1, 2 dose rates are for young Māori and young Pacific 12 to 14 in South Africa? Uh, you want the overall region? 12 to 14. Oh, we don't, I don't have a specific... 12 to 14. A sp yeah. oh, which age range would you like? 12 to 39. Okay, so for... Uh, 12 to 19, dose one in the Auckland region is 60%, uh, 20 to 34, 58, 35 to 49, 70, 50 to 64, 86, uh, and 65 and over is 94. Yeah, uh, it's all available publicly. <laughs> the last, the last uh, update is from Wednesday, so that's yep. much data. So did we have the young age group for Māori and Pacific? And I will, I will say that that is from Thursday the 14th of October. They'll be updating it today with all the data, taking into all the data from the weekend as well. Yeah. Do you have a on what that rate needs to be for the young Māori Pacific age group for restrictions, before restrictions can be safely eased in order? As we've said, we are going to speak in more detail on some of these issues on Friday. Be a okay, so Mark, be a, will there be a Māori Pacific? Yeah, between the you know, first doses and second doses, some of these people who get a first dose and then don't come back for a second one. Do you expect that to close, to narrow and other efforts to reach out to those people? Because it would seem to be, mm -hmm. if you did set a target of 95%, then you need to get 100% first dose. Yes, that is correct. Um, that is correct. If you wanted to hit 95, you'd need, you would, you would presumably need 100 and first, 100 percent on first dose. Okay. Yeah. So, so currently, no, I was answering the question around if you were seeking 95 percent, which has been recommended by some uh, advocates, 
that you would need to have 100% first dose in order to reach 95% second dose. Relating that you might be going then for... You are absolutely incorrect to do so. That was merely an answer to a question, Dr Bloomfield. Yes, so to date it's been about a 95-96% um, uh, sort of follow through on that second dose, but that's using a specific cutoff uh, point, and so it may be just some people have delayed that second dose beyond the cutoff that is used. But there is an active program um, which um, Fakarangaro Healthline is supporting in um, making phone calls out to those people whose second dose is overdue, as it were, uh, to, to, to get to boost that um, second dose uptake. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'll let you go, Mark. On the level four issue, um, yeah. the, the expectation is that a level four lockdown might not make such a big difference because the people who aren't following the rules of level three won't do it at level four either. As the outbreak continues you to grow, see that a little more directly than I heard for use. As the outbreak continues to grow elsewhere in Auckland and reaches out to, you know, the, the wider city, is there a chance that that arithmetic changes a little bit and, and actually a level four of lockdown? Could yeah. Be so look, I think what it's fair to say is that we will always keep under review our settings. And whilst that's been the decision today, uh, we, we are uh, going to do what we've always done and constantly look at what's occurring, what the outbreak is telling us, what we can learn from the nature of the outbreak. And if all of that data changes, then the advice may well change. But this is the advice we have for now. And Prime Minister, what I would say is talking to my counterpart, uh, Dr Brendan Murphy in Australia last week, uh, he said it was really clear what the impact was of high vaccination levels in Sydney. Mm. Um, and the levels they've got there are just slightly ahead of what we've got in Tamaki mm. Makoto. Uh, but he said it's very obvious the impact, and you can see their case numbers are really dropping there. Mm -hmm. so so the the yeah, yeah. Just a couple of questions. Um, were there any COVID cases that have been announced today or yesterday that had attended the protest on Saturday? And also, is there any update on the five to 11 year old age group vaccination eligibility? Yeah. So um, what we tend to do in our case reports is we will have uh, proactive reporting from our team on the ground as to whether or not there's anything that's considered particularly high risk or of note. I, we haven't, I haven't had it reported to me that there's been a case amongst protesters. No, not as yet. Uh, and our, our great hope is that there aren't. Um, but I would ask all those people who were at those events or indeed any other social events over the weekend, if they have symptoms, please get a test straight away. On the 5 to 11s, look, there's no real change in that. The only country that has had an application, as I understand it, so far is the USA. The USA and yeah. um, we are expecting the data to be provided to MedSafe uh, soon for um, mm. an application to get approval for the uh, vaccine for five to 11 year olds and we will let you know as soon as that is received. So yeah, that's a really important point to note that actually we can't actively move on the issue until Pfizer submits data to us for consideration and they have not yet done that, but um, as soon as they have, we'll, we'll let you know. So just on inflation today, were you yeah. concerned by that level? Look, it is, it, is, it, is, it is not out of step with what we are seeing um, uh, internationally. And I was just looking at the reports, of course, the US is at 5.4%, uh, Canada at 4.1%. So you can see that uh, the impacts of COVID, particularly in New Zealand, the impact on supply chain, uh, you've seen coming through in the increase that we've seen today. Yep. Um, will that be targeted to industries or will that support depend on um, falls in revenue similar to, to the wage subsidies? If you don't mind, I am going to let Minister Robertson just stick with sharing more information on Friday. Okay, and in terms of um, households, you've previously um, indicated that low income households might receive some more financial support. Yes. <coughs> I might, yeah, what I might do is see whether or not we can actually put a date on when we're likely to announce those, because I am aware that we have um, signalled to you that that's coming, decisions have been made, so um, I'll make sure that we set some dates and communicate them to you. And then we assume that that, that will be um, a fairly limited amount of financial support? Uh, you can assume that we continue to be quite targeted in trying to reach those households who need it the most. He was um, said over the weekend that he was go cabinet was going I'll to... I'll come down to... And then I'll come over to you. Change of subject. Uh, what's the current state of play in terms of decision making on the three waters issues? Ah, I'll let Minister Mahuta make announcements on that in due course as well. So nothing further to update you on at this point. Yeah, Mr. Hopkins uh, mentioned on the weekend that Cabinet was considering today MIQ alternatives. How quickly could Kiwis overseas um, 
PCRing down shorter stays in MIQ or home isolation. Yeah, so we've always said as part of our reconnecting New Zealand work that shortened stays and home isolation were and are part of our future plan for reconnecting New Zealand to the world. Uh, and of course, though, the calculation for us is to continue with whatever we changes we make to do that safely and in a considered way. When we've got further announcements to make there, we will. That everything's kind of being brought forward. Cases yes, are isolating in the community, that yeah. discrepancy is, is growing. So is, when can Kiwi start coming home? It and, is and fair to say that of course this outbreak has caused us to bring forward some of the plans that we may have already had. That's not to say that we won't still continue to be really considered in the decisions we make. Make sure that they make sense in the environment we're operating in, but that also we're operating safely. We don't want to unnecessarily seed potential cases in the community when we are still continuing to control and manage and reduce cases as much as we can, particularly in Tamaki Makoto. There are so few cases at the border. There are more, vastly more cases within the community. Kiwi's overseas. Five today. Five today. Yeah. Was it 60 in the community? So you see there's that discrepancy and Kiwis overseas are really stressed yeah. if he had shorter stays in ISO I think or I'm, home isolation. I'm probably just going to yes, repeat the same answer I just gave. Forward this year, Kiwis can ha come home by Christmas, be reunited. I'll just families. repeat the same answer I've given. Perhaps I can do it in a shorter soundbite for you. As part of our Reconnecting New Zealand work, we are looking to shorten MIQ stays and we have been looking at self-isolation. The outbreak in Auckland has brought forward a number of our other plans. This is an area where we are actively considering as we speak, but top of mind for us when we do make changes will be safety and we will be very considered. I don't have announcements for you today, but it's something we're working on right now. Hi, Minister, just on um, Yes, Joe. Mm -hmm. um, as, as we continue with vaccination, we're gonna to have to get more targeted about it if we get into the group who are not particularly keen. We know yeah. that Māori are low, we know that to a lesser extent um, Sikh are low as well. What information do you have around what that other group is? I know you have been into the regions in the last couple of weeks, you were in Taranaki at the end of last week. Were you speaking to people there who are that thing Yes. What are their reasons? What sort of demographic are they? How do you get to that other group of people that aren't the obvious Māori yeah. Sikh? Question. The one thing I would say is that we, we do tend to speak and there tends to be a generalisation about Māori per vaccination rates that don't take into account how high the vaccination rates are for our older Māori and I think it's really important to keep acknowledging that because uh, you know for in Auckland alone it's 94% for first dose for our over 65s. Yeah. 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 But for you know what am I hearing? Um, I'm hearing that actually the majority of people who have not been vaccinated to date aren't what people would characterise as anti-vaccination. They have questions, uh, they have concerns, and sometimes it will be based on, uh, on um, incorrect information online. It'll be based on something that they've heard, and they are really just seeking an answer to some of that. And once you have a conversation or connect them to someone who can answer those questions, that actually they will um, make that decision for themselves and their family. That takes a really targeted approach. It takes us actually finding those people, having the conversation, not waiting for them to come to us. So it is much more labour intensive. So you can also have the group, and we saw on New Southern Nation at the weekend, the, the Taranaki midwives. Um, and I think there's about 10 or 15 of them who are not going to get vaccinated out of about 63. It's like 15% of them or something. So when you have got uh, people in a community who are working in health, yeah. um, who are educated, yeah. highly skilled, you know, middle high that. income people. Like, how? What do you do about that? Because they're going to be the difficult group, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. and I think you, you do exactly what we've done. Say, so actually, for those really high risk areas where we need to protect. I mean, a, a, a mother giving birth needs deserves to know that they're doing that in a safe environment. And so we can do what we can to protect people in those vulnerable environments, and we're doing that with the vaccine mandates that we've been rolling out. And secondly, we have to create a space where people can answer, ask questions. And, and I know people are getting to a point where they just want people vaccinated. Please still be willing to have a conversation with people, because that's how you move them. Putting up a wall uh, and being unwilling to have that discussion makes it really hard. It's really easy to record how many uh, teachers and health workers aren't vaccinated and where they are, and are you going to do specific targeting well, to reach those people? Yeah, yeah. well, um, obviously, so we, uh, health providers do know who are unvaccinated, and of course we're careful with that information and who has access to it, but they do, and they can do targeted work with those different groups. 
we will, uh, you know, there will be an ability to know with education because, of course, we've got a vaccine mandate there. Yep. Sorry, I'm going to I'm going to kind of run down to the last set of questions. So I'm going to try and come to those who haven't really had that many, if I can. Sorry. Yes. Um, just on a totally different tack. Um, how concerned are you about the 4.9 percent inflation rate, and if the government's going to do anything to try and control it? Yeah, so look, I would, as, as I've already said, what we're seeing here in New Zealand, very similar to what other countries are experiencing. It is not considered necessarily um, to be a long-term position for New Zealand, a lot being driven here by, for instance, some of our supply chain issues that are actually being experienced globally because of COVID-19. So it is something that you can expect over time to resolve itself. Nothing that you can do as the government to kind of well, again, for things like uh, what's happening with, you know, uh, shipping costs and constraints there, or global oil prices, there are there are limits to what we can do there. Yeah. On that issue, the um, low-income households are disproportionately affected by higher inflation. Yeah. Um, and get, getting to this point where we have higher inflation, low-income households were again affected because they didn't benefit from the asset price inflation that we saw when tax rates were cut. So people who didn't own property were hit last year, now they hit this year as inflation goes up. Mm -hmm. so, so how are you factoring in that situation into, into your policy making just sort of more broadly? Yeah. And, and look, that, that implies that somehow a focus on low income households would be a shift or just simply a response to inflation, whereas actually we've long held a policy approach that has been about trying to lift specifically the incomes of those who currently have the lowest wages in the country. And we've been trying to leverage that up, um, be it through you know, the levers that we have, um, minimum wage, through uh, as an employer ourselves, through some of the targeted tax credit regimes that we have. And we will continue to do that because we are very focused on, on you know, the cost of living for our low income households. Yeah, sorry, I'm gonna assume it look, I'll come to you. You haven't had a question. Um, Dr. Bloomfield, are there any pregnant women in hospital at the moment with COVID-19? And if so, are they unvaccinated? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I will go away and check that um, uh, for you, just to be certain about that. What I would say is that, um, not speaking necessarily for pregnant women, uh, that you know very few of our hospitalised cases during this outbreak have been fully vaccinated. The vast majority have been unvaccinated, yeah. but we will find out the answer to that specifically. And Dr Bloomfield, I don't know whether we, I mean, as a opportunity for a public service announcement, some of the stats out of the United States around, uh, around or even Australia around hospitalised pregnant yeah. women has been, yeah, pretty, pretty devastating. Yeah, there, there is no doubt uh, that the vaccine is very safe in pregnancy at any point in time and not only affords protection to the pregnant person but also um, some protection uh, through the placenta to, to the infant as well or in utero and then obviously they carry that through post birth. So um, my, you know, my strong encouragement here in New Zealand is for pregnant women to, to talk to their health professional and to strongly consider getting vaccinated. And you say that because, Joe, as you asked, one of the things I've picked up whilst being out on the road is that people have been waiting to have their babies before being vaccinated. And look, whilst I'm really pleased that those individuals have been safe in that intervening period of time, actually uh, it would have been devastating if they had COVID um, um, before they were vaccinated because the outcomes we're seeing in the hospitalisations and the severe illness in pregnant women is awful. Minister, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Gina, Ben, and then I'm going to finish on Bernard. Just a, um, clarification, that alert... alert level review that's happening in two weeks for Auckland, will that include the boundary around Auckland, or is the boundary intact until Auckland gets down to level two, or until there's a one... Yeah, being so definitive about it is to say it will remain until X point, but what we are doing is work uh, to see how we can safely uh, uh, allow Aucklanders um, to, you know, continue movement safely. Uh, and so that is a piece of work that we're doing, regardless, regardless of what happens with the boundary. On the table in two weeks, or is that a longer piece of work? Yeah, that's something that we want to do to ensure that, uh, you know, if, for instance, there is reason to continue with the boundary, we can have, you know, greater, greater safe, greater movement. I, I do highlight safe because I know there's a lot of anxiety in parts of the country where there might be low vaccination rates. 
And I just want to be really clear that we are working very hard to ensure that whatever we do is imposing risk to other parts of the country, but also acknowledging there's lots of needs for Aucklanders to move around. At the moment, the reasons they can are very limited. What we dropped in two weeks? Uh, look, that's not something that we've considered, but we're doing work to, to just regardless of what happens, that we're ready with options. Ben? You've resisted setting a vaccine target until now, and your government has ridiculed opponents who have set vaccine targets saying that there shouldn't be a vaccine target. I don't think I ridiculed anyone. Okay. <laughs> this government's ministers, several of them, right. have derided opponents for doing so. Why is now, or Friday, the right time to set the vaccine target? Well, as you um, have heard Dr Bloomfield say, you know, whilst, you know, everyone will call it that, I, I would be loath to ever see that we have a point where we keep vaccinating and then people think job done. Job's not done until every person has, has, in my mind, until we have tried to reach every single person and we have been vaccinated because it's a way we can keep them safe. So what we're trying to do though is give greater certainty to Auckland and New Zealand about what the future looks like in a highly vaccinated environment. And so that naturally lends itself to saying, here's when we believe we can start making some changes to our system. It's not the idea that suddenly you cut loose and we don't have anything in place, not at all. We no, still need to be careful, but it's just about talking about milestones for when we can make next moves. Bernard. I'm planning for the summer. Um, yeah. What advice would you give to people who are getting close to drop dead dates for booking travel and family holidays and, yeah. and all those festival organisers? Yeah. You must be right on the edge of saying that's it. Yeah, well, actually, I talk to some of those and have a bit of a sense of the points in which they have to make de decisions, and we're very mindful of those. And as I say, one of the reasons we're on Friday looking to set out this framework and, and a sense of you know, when we believe we'll be able to make transitions is to try and help with some of that planning as much as we can. Did, did I, say Mark? Mark? I think, Mark, you were next. Um, uh. <laughs> were you? Is, uh, has Pfizer applied to Medsafe for the ability to use a booster shot in New Zealand? Not yet, but we are expecting that, and of course we are um, planning a pace to ensure that um, once that uh, uh, application comes through and goes through the approval process and Cabinet agrees, then we're in a position both with the vaccine and the program to start delivering a booster yep. shot. Approval work in terms of is it more like the original Pfizer approval process and, and the time that that took, or is it more like expanding to a new age group in terms of that that one seems to go through quite a lot quicker? It's more like the latter. So in a sense, they're asking for a, a sort of a revision of the original approval process to add in that third booster, uh, uh, do third dose as a booster. Yeah. The reason that, food, that that age range decision took a little longer, though, obviously uh, Pfizer went through MedSafe. MedSafe gave, turned it around quite quickly, and then it went through our technical advisory group, and the technical advisory group um, uh, spent some quite some quite some time considering it. So, so that was the difference in that process there. Okay. Oh, I feel like I believe that I called Mark the last question. So I'm going to. The same caveats on the on the reconnecting plan. We have the same vaccine caveats for those two groups for Friday's plan. What do you mean by vaccine caveats? Sorry. It has to be uh, high high vaccine for age groups across the region and for the vulnerable. So, ah, so know, obviously, so this is just another attempt to extract information that we'll be sharing on Friday. So I'm going to stick to that. And a total demerit point as a whole. Jenny, you can blame Derek for the fact that I'm now calling time. Pro Hamilton Business, will they be included in the business support package on Friday? Uh, you heard me say Minister Robertson will give more details around the work we're doing on Friday.